from New York City, for our viewers worldwide, I'm Manish Cranny. In for Jonathan Farrow, it's bank, Bounce Back Thursday. Will it last? It is day two of mega tech with Apple, Amazon and Meta, all setting the agenda after the close. The countdown to the open, well, that starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in the show, futures rebound from the worst day of the year. And the Fed delivers a reality check on the rate cut expectations. Investors brace for the next wave of big bad tech earnings. We begin with a big issue looking ahead to, you got it, Jobs Day in the USA. The bigger news for the week is probably going to be payrolls. We do get payrolls on Friday. Payrolls. Payrolls report. Jobs report will be an important number. Or important for our outlook for equities. To get a sense of, is the labor market slowing? We have a very robust labor market. The labor market is, is basically chugging along. I don't think the labor market's really a problem. I think the labor market is a real bright spot right now. I think strong payroll is positive for markets. And the labor market tends to be often a lagging indicator. Just under the surface, the labor market is cooling. Whether it shows up, I mean, it's a noisy number. Whether it shows up on Friday or not is harder to tell. Joining me now to discuss everything in the markets, MUFG's George Goncalves and Sophie's Liz Young. OK, here we go. Uh, we had the pushback from Powell yesterday. We're looking forward to maybe a little bit of a slowdown in the jobs report tomorrow. But I want to focus on yesterday before we cast ahead. At the presser, George, you said it was a hawkish U-turn. It came out of nowhere. Well, what is greater confidence before they move forward is the question I have. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, look, I think uh, Chair Powell is really trying to buy time. I think in general, the Fed has been trying to buy time. And so, you know, really trying to cool the markets, which have been really forcing this issue for quite some time, that eventually we all know they're going to start uh, easing rates. It's just a matter of when, when do they start, right? And, you know, given that, you know, March is just, you know, six weeks away and there's a lot that could happen between now and then, but at the same time, you know, they're not ready to communicate uh, you know, ahead of time. I guess that was the prudent thing to do to kind of get greater confidence. But I think it's beyond that. They're really trying to sequence things and slow us down. Um, they know once they start cutting, the market's going to run. Yeah, I mean, sequencing, they've tried that before. Uh, Liz, good morning. How are you? I mean, there's lots of, lots of uh, notes that you have. The cuts go marching away, and it was a little bit of tough love. I call that a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happened here is that the market actually hadn't been listening to Powell for a long time. He'd been pretty clear that from the beginning, from the beginning of this hiking cycle, that they would rather wait a little bit too long instead of go too early with cuts and reignite inflation, reignite financial loosening that might get us to a place where they have to start hiking again later. I think that they are pretty terrified to repeat some of the mistakes of the 70s. And what he did yesterday was remind markets that even though you may want a cut in March, you may want us to start doing that to support valuations, the data that we see and the confidence that we have isn't quite there yet. So let's be realistic. But the interesting thing is the market did price out a cut in March stays consistent still with six by the end of the year and just started to back end load them. So the market hasn't necessarily come off of what we think is going to happen this year. It's just pushed back the beginning. Yeah, well, there's always a way of rearranging the deck chairs, isn't it, when you're desperate for, for the trade. Uh, and let's talk about those traders. They're bracing for a jobs number, a payrolls report coming in tomorrow. Uh, it is the finale to an action-packed week. Mike McKee is with me. Mike, uh, what is the round number? What's the whisper? Where are we? What's our thinking? Well, our thinking is we get one more good month, but it may not make a whole lot of difference to the Fed. Now, Jay Powell did say if the labor market goes bad, they could move up their rate cuts. And we did get a disappointing number for jobless claims today with uh, claims coming in at uh, 224,000 after uh, 214,000 the week before. We've had a lot of layoff notices. Does that mean we're likely to see a bad number tomorrow? Not really. Um, 
this is January data tomorrow and we're in February. The change in payrolls still expected to be strong, 185,000, and the unemployment rate is expected to go up but still stay below 4%. Average hourly earnings, this will be interesting, uh, expected up three-tenths of a percent, but base of X keep it on a year-over-year -year basis at 4.1%. We should mention one reason that wages can run ahead of uh, inflation at this point is that productivity is way up, 3.2% in the fourth quarter. And this is the number that the Fed is going to be watching. Uh, they've expected unemployment to rise, but 23 months so far, it has stayed below 4%. Only one time in history has that happened before, and that was in 1967-68 during the Vietnam War when half the people who were in the labor force were over in Vietnam. So if that starts to go up, there could be a problem, but the betting is we're still going to see a 24th month in a row tomorrow. Okay, uh, setting the stage, Mike McKee, it's uh, all eyes down for that. John Go uh, George uh, Goncalves, Liz Young are with me, my panel for the morning. Uh, that's a pretty staggering number, isn't it? Unemployment, sub 4%, for 23 months in a row. You haven't seen that since 1967. You can understand why Powell tried to deflate a little bit of risk yesterday, can't you, George? Well, you know what happened in the early 70s, right? We had a, the uh, Nifty 50, we had a, a pretty big uh, boom in, in risk assets and then it kind of went into a recession as well. So, I mean, look, we, I mean, it's great to look at these historical analogs and comparisons. To me, it's more about, you know, what's it gonna be the, you know, the change and what's gonna matter from here going forward. And that unemployment rate going up, it could have gone up to 4% last month and it did it because of how, labor force participation rate was accounted for. So uh, at this point, I think we're at the real risk where the unemployment rate actually starts to move much faster. You have those layoffs. Uh, January was a big layoff month in general. So there is downside risk. Yeah, the, uh, the ADP number was close to 100. Uh, I think there's downside risk for tomorrow's number. And more importantly, we get also these benchmark revisions, which I think could be uh, illuminating as well. So I, I'm actually you know, concerned about tomorrow's number, reminding folks that you know, there are cracks forming underneath the surface in the labor market, and the headlines look great, but you know, a lot of it is optics. Yeah, Liz, I mean, it wouldn't take much to jolt us. I mean, it took a tiny whisper of a miss by Alphabet yesterday on core advertising sales to give us a shakedown. It took a lack of huge forward guidance from Microsoft to just unnerve us. So this macro data, it only takes one sort of large prig, uh, in, in, prick in the balloon uh, to unsettle us, doesn't it? I think that's right, but I'm not sure that we're there yet, at least in the labor market. But I do think George is right that we do run the risk right now with unemployment where it is. Typically, what you see is as unemployment starts to tick up, it catches velocity and it starts to move very, very quickly. So if and when that turns up, it's probably not going to be this stepwise calm function upward from 3.7 to 3.8 to 3.9 yeah. and, and a tenth of a percent at a time. So we do run the risk of sort of escape velocity on that number. The difference with the labor market is that the data that we get on a monthly basis, so what we're going to see this Friday, is pretty lagged. It takes a while for it to start to react. And I wouldn't expect it to be inching towards zero jobs added. I do expect it to continue to cool. But I think the Fed's threshold for pain is higher than people are wanting it to be. I think that they do expect more cooling in the labor market and they're okay with it. In fact, maybe even welcome it to try to assuage the, the fears of a wage price spiral and all the other things that we worried about when the labor market was so tight. So I think as investors, we have to up our threshold for pain with some of that economic data and understand that even an unemployment rate at 4.1, 4.2% is still quite low by historical standards. Liz, give me your, your viewpoint on this. Last week, it was record after record. We were going into the earnings. I opened the Bank of America flow show this morning. Mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies dump the most amount of equities in a decade since 2015. Is that smart money taking money off the table at a near-term peak? Because that... That's quite an indication. That's quite a stat, isn't it? The most amount of money in a week out of the market in a decade. It is. 
But when you put it in the context of the rally that's happened since the end of October, also a rally that's in the 98th or 99th percentile mm -hmm. by historical standards as well. So taking some of that money off the table and, and really in context, it didn't cause that much of a drawdown, right? So taking some of that money off the table is valuation based. And it's just the idea that when you look at the technicals of the market, they did look extended. Nobody can really deny that. I think what we have to look at and what we're obviously dealing with this week with big tech earnings is that we need something that will drive a rally forward in a durable fashion. And big tech companies are expected to contribute the majority of earnings power to the S&P for this last quarter. So we need those earnings to come in solid. We don't necessarily need them to knock it out of the park, but we do need them to come in solid to prove that the level of valuations that we're at is worthy of new money to be added. And I think right now a lot of investors are questioning whether or not 20 times forward earnings on the S&P makes sense at this juncture. Yeah, I mean, there's a wonderful line from BI. 28 times forward earnings, it's just a, a 0.2 away from an all-time high. This is on the MAG7, and so you've got like a near 40% premium to the index. George, what is that moves the needle for you in, in terms of calculating risk. We're looking at Apple, we're looking at Meta, so on the equity side, we're gonna have some proof points on that. But this bond market seems trapped in the hell that is 375 to 425 offered. I mean, look, I think it's ironic that yesterday, obviously Fed Day, also the, the announcement of the Treasury's uh, auction schedule, which if you go back three months ago, marked the beginning of the rally in everything. So November 1st, so we had you know, a Fed meeting as well. We had. The Treasury say you know, their issuance patterns are going to be less, and that marked a big rally and a kind of a short covering move into year end, which continued to the beginning of this year. I think it's ironic. We live in these hyper narrative kind of environments. I think it kind of bookends a pretty big move. You know, everything's pretty much priced to perfection and priced to the idea that we're soft landing. So it's already in the tape. So the question from here is all about risk management. It's about being defensive and it's about being in shorter duration and fixed income. And really, you know, the bond market has done a lot of this pricing in already, yeah. but it doesn't mean it's wrong. No, but we're going to touch on uh, commercial property, which could be uh, a little bit discomforting for a few people uh, in this market. Well, we, maybe we should pay a little bit of attention to it. We'll come to that in a moment. George uh, Goncalves and Liz Young, my guests this morning on the markets. Let's get under the hood, see what's ahead of the opening bell. Abigail Doolittle is with me. It feels like big brother, day two of big tech. Uh, day two of big tech, but let's take a look first at cruise lines. I don't know if you would go on a cruise, Manus. I really have no desire, but apparently a lot of other people do because Royal Caribbean put up a great quarter. They topped adjusted earnings with a profit of $1.25. Uh, truly incredible relative to those losses during the pandemic. And some analysts are even saying that the outlook is impressive. Count me out, though. Honeywell down 2.4%. The fourth quarter was good, but the fiscal year revenue range fell short. In addition, the CEO was named as the board chairman. That's not a reason for the stock being down, but just some additional information that came out of that report. And then finally, here's some big tech. Interestingly, coming into today over the last year, Qualcomm only up about 5%, right now down 2.4%. The fourth quarter was a big beat. The outlook was solid, but they did warn that their inventory is building. Investors not liking that right now. Qualcomm, another chip maker, down after earnings. No, I'm not a buyer of the whole cruise. Open-ended bar, open-ended food. I wouldn't, I'd just come back and wouldn't into any of the suits. Abby, thank you very much. <laughs> Abigail Doolittle. Coming up on the show, I warned you, commercial real estate, it's a concern and it is hitting regional banks. I'd say um, for the most part, everything's in the rearview mirror now. So yesterday's announcement uh, on NYCB was a bit of a surprise. I think that's an outlier. Is it a nightlier? Mm -hmm. We take a deeper look at the New York Community Bank's warning. That's next on Bloomberg. I'd say, um, for the most part, everything's in the rearview mirror now. So there were a few uh, idiosyncratic uh, bank failures um, that related to the business model and how fast those banks grew, uh, and then the stress caused by the Fed raising rates very quickly. So yesterday's announcement uh, on NYCB was a bit of a surprise. I think that's an outlier. 
It's an outlier. That's the Citizens Financial CEO, Bruce Vanson, downplaying the risks facing regional banks and commercial real estate. Now, New York Community Bank had a record one-day plunge. We brought that to you about 24 hours ago, reporting swollen credit losses of 552 million bucks, half a billion dollars, bringing commercial real estate back into the spotlight and an area of potential pain. Joining me now is Abigail Doolittle with a deeper dive. Abby, take it away. Well, I think one thing everybody can agree on was that yesterday was a shock, that we did have that plunge for NYCB, New York Community Bank Corp, and that the reason behind it, as you mentioned, those swollen uh, loan loss preserves 12 times the estimate. But beneath that, they also, in addition, cut their dividend. And the reason that they cut the dividend, because we don't know the composition for those loan loss provisions, but the driver of cutting the, driv the dividend was had to do, the bank said, with uh, office and multifamily commercial real estate. So this seemed like it was last year. I think that there are other experts, people in real estate, Manus, who might disagree with the CEO of Citizen saying that there could be some kind of quote-unquote uh, debt crisis ahead. Uh, that's according to one of my sources. Given the fact that you have 1.5 trillion CMBS due by the end of 2025, all of those factors that he mentioned, uh, it really creates a backdrop for values to potentially fall. 80% of CMBS is held by the regional bank, so it is somewhat spread out. Uh, but we could have other situations as occurred yesterday with NYCB. I think it's too early to say whether or not it's over because a lot of these properties, they simply haven't traded. So we don't know how bad the distress is going to be. We don't know how bad the values are going to be. But some of the uh, big office owners that I've talked to, uh, mall owners that I've talked to recently in Bloomberg interviews, Manus, they've said that in New York here, values could drop as much as 25 to 75 so basically a loan would be worth 25 cents on the dollar from previous values. That could still be kind of painful, so stay tuned. Okay, whether it is idiosyncratic or not, multitudes of idiosyncrasies can cause a big problem. Abigail, thank you very much. Abigail Doolittle. The panel this morning is George Goncalves, Liz Young with me. I mean, look, call me old-fashioned, but a huge canary in the coal mine yesterday. Deutsche Bank, 123 million of a write down on U.S. property. A Japanese, number 16 bank in Japan, uh, tanks 20% on U.S. property. Is it idiosyncratic, George, or can it manifest into something more? Look, I think it's a reminder. I think it's idiosyncratic for now, and we have to take it at face value as the information comes, comes in and, and things can, can change quickly. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it is, again, that reminder that this is going to be with us for quite some time. This is going to take a lot of many years to work out this. What's different than what we've been used to in the last decade or so, these kind of acute, big uh, financial shocks that uh, come out of nowhere, uh, this is not that. I mean, this is not systemic, okay. hopefully. Not. It's more of a kind of a death by a thousand cuts, right? <laughs> okay, so it's not 2008, but it is, it, it is an ongoing uh, death by a thousand cuts. You're right, it could be individual names rather than a systemic issue, and the banks are better capitalized, so we're told. Uh, Liz, $560 billion worth of commercial real estate comes into maturity through the end of 2025. Is it just going to be a series of bumps in the road, or what opportunities would it present for you? Well, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that we've known about this commercial real estate risk for a long time, and frankly, since the regional bank crisis happened last March. So it won't be something that comes out of left field, even if there are negative headlines about it. I think the real risk is that when you look at the timing of how this may all shake out, and with the news that we got yesterday about New York Community Bank Corp., the the bank term funding program is set to expire in March of this year. So some of the backstop that regional banks have perhaps relied on, and we don't know how much and, and whom in particular is relying on it, but some of the backstop is set to disappear. So some of the risks that maybe we haven't seen yet, we haven't seen come to the surface, could come to the surface in late spring, early summer, and then we still have this lingering commercial real estate risk that we know is there, and to the point that was made earlier in the segment, we just don't know what the marks are on those particular loans. So as things get refinanced, mm -hmm. it could come out that it's a bigger problem than we originally thought. But again, the important thing is, and the important thing for market reactions is, we already know this is a problem. This is not going to be some sort of shock that nobody was prepared for. So in the meantime, I don't think it's something that's going to come out and surprise us. But I do think that it's something we have to keep in mind when thinking about regional banks and their exposure going forward. 
And, and to that end, um, Liz, let's just square it away. You see these pockets of drawdown. I like what you said, which is, look, Manus, you can sell the most amount of stock in a decade at the institutional level, but it didn't knock the market. It didn't brutally bruise the market. So are you specifically looking for opportunities when there are drawdowns? I mean, do you think that we will get a 5%, 10% drawdown, or it's just going to be these incremental days of 1%, 1.5%, but nothing cataclysmic? Well, there's always a risk for, for a bigger shock, but I do think that in the context of seeing such a ferocious ferocious rally, it's healthy to have those little pullbacks. And and honestly, even a 5 to 10% correction, quite normal, quite, quite customary in the context of the market, those little pullbacks are healthy. What I would be looking at for opportunity in mm -hmm. some of those pullbacks are the things that did not keep up with the market in 2023. What we've had as a theme for the last couple of years is this big rotation aspect in the sense of what did bad last year does well the year following. So when you look at what happened in 2023 and this huge bifurcation among the MAG-7 versus the rest of the market, I'd be shopping in the rest of the market category because if we do indeed pull off a soft landing, you probably want to have exposure to those cyclical stocks and maybe the rest of tech, some of that smaller cap tech that didn't keep up last year. But you also want to barbell that with some of those sectors that haven't necessarily shown their luster yet, but they would be considered more defensive sectors. Healthcare is a good spot mm -hmm. to be shopping right now, I think. Staples, I think, is a good spot. Utilities. And if the Fed starts cutting rates in spring or maybe early summer, you have rates coming down, dividend paying stocks start to look much more attractive. So those are some of the places that I'd be shopping, particularly during a small pullback. Okay, George, we, you know what? In 30 seconds, give me what, what a barbell looks like to you for risk. Okay, the barbell, I mean, for us is still uh, being defensive and having uh, high quality IG. I mean, it's, it's a little bit too tight here, so maybe lightening up there, uh, but moving and staying in the front of the curve. I mean, the Fed's going to start an easing cycle this year because if it doesn't, we're not going to have a soft landing. Yep, uh, they got to pull the trigger at some stage. Uh, the question is, is that going to be May or June? George, thank you so much. Liz, uh, great conversation. George Goncalves uh, and Liz Young, my guests this morning on the market. Morning calls coming up. Richard Bernstein from uh, Richard Bernstein Advisors joins me right here this morning. Bounce back Thursday for now because we're counting down to day two of a massive uh, tech reporting. Uh, Nasdaq futures up a half of 1%. Institutions sold the most amount of stocks in one week relative to 2015, the most in a decade. Time now for your morning calls. This is what we've got from the scribes of Wall Street. First up, Citigroup downgrades Qualcomm to neutral, pointing to the company's disappointing outlook. Next up, Deutsche Bank upgrades Cigna to a buy, expecting the sale of its Medicare business to serve as a catalyst. And finally, Goldman Sachs adding Target to its conviction buy list, highlighting the stock's compelling valuation and, of course, the resilient U.S. consumer. Coming up in the show, Richard Bernstein joins me. Is he as optimistic about the resilience of the consumer? Uh, what is quality breadth to Richard Bernstein? That's next on Bloomberg. Who makes your Wilson tennis rackets? Hammer Sports, they're looking happy up there on the balcony. A small rebound in this equity market. You saw one of the biggest sell-offs across the equity markets yesterday on the back of Jay Powell pushing back on March as a live cut meeting and deflating some of the sentiment in the market. We're rolling over to a happier opening. It's a big day. 15% of the S&P 500 will report after the bell today. Amazon, uh, Apple, along with Meta, defining the next trajectory in AI. There you go. And they're happy over at the Nasdaq as well. Equity markets set for a, a warmer opening today. One stock we are keeping an eye on. It is Qualcomm reporting better than expected sales and profits, but delivering a modest outlook for the year ahead. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joins me now. Is this the poor man's NVIDIA? Ed, good morning. Is it a poor man's NVIDIA? It's an interesting question. With Qualcomm, you always have to go back to basics, modems that go into smartphones. And the big picture outlook, 
Smartphone sales overall will grow flat to slightly up in 2024. They declined in 2023. There's an inventory issue and debate to be had here, which is that they are showing signs that smartphone makers work through inventories and those inventories have stabilized. So there will be some forward ordering. There's some confidence, therefore, in the outlook for the current period in terms of revenue, but also EPS. The worry is everything else, connected appliances that Qualcomm calls IoT. And in that sense, the recovery is going to be delayed to the second half of this year. But Manis, you may have a sense of deja vu. I've said this before. How many chip makers will say, well, the recovery is coming. It's just going to be in the second half of this year. The AI story with Qualcomm is they want to be in the race, both on the smartphone and PC. It's a show me the money. Where is it showing up in the financials? Not quite yet. Yep, uh, you're right. Uh, everybody wants to be in the race, Ed. Uh, Ed Ludlow there with the very latest. And Ed will be sitting down with the Qualcomm president and CEO, uh, Cristiano Amon. That's a little bit later today on Bloomberg Technology at 11.45 a.m. I don't think he'd be putting the, are you the poor man's NVIDIA to the CEO. Might be a bit disingenuous. It's just trashy market talk. Let's turn our attention to the financials. Investors are watching the shares of the New York Community Bank after its biggest one-day decline on record. Abigail Doolittle is with me. So, Abby, it's a debate, isn't it, uh, as to whether it is idiosyncratic and just their problem. Good morning. It, it certainly is, and good morning, Manus. It's also a debate for shareholders because the stock had been up about 2% in the pre-market, a little bit of a recovery. Now it's down. The reason that the stock had some sort of a bounce yesterday after the close, after that record plunge, management did say that 2024 net interest income would be above the street. But in the uh, light of what you were just talking about, the fact that their loan loss provisions are more than half a trillion, 12 times the estimate, they lowered the dividend to raise uh, reserves for commercial real estate, specifically office and multifamily, it's just too scary in terms of what could be next for investors. So the stock is still down. Uh, and it does put the spotlight, to your point, back on CMBS. Is it going to be a big issue in 2024, bigger than it turned out to be in 2023? The reason it matters is 80% of the $1.5 trillion uh, CMBS that's coming due by the end of 2025, well, those values haven't been established. So it's going to be interesting to see whether this is a one-off or if it's more spread out, as some of the real estate experts that I've talked about saying, that there really could be some sort of a debt crisis ahead, Manus. Okay, well, the Citizens Bank CEO told us its uh, regional bank pain is in the past. It'll play out on the marks, won't it? Uh, Abby, thank you very much. Turn our attention to earnings season. Peloton results coming up short, warning investors, but another sales decline for the current quarter. We're all going back to the gym. Katie Greifeld. Another rough ride for Peloton shares this morning. Let's get into some of these numbers right now. Third quarter revenue forecast, it came in between 700 to $725 million. That was short of estimates. And for the year, Peloton revised its revenue forecast down to 2.68 to $2.75 billion. The estimate had been for $2.74 billion, so right below the upper end of that range. And that's really sinking shares this morning, Manus, especially given that the second quarter was just okay. Revenue, it beat slightly while the uh, loss per share was in line for estimates. And as you know, this has been a long turnaround story for Peloton, and it's clear that this journey is not yet over. In the shareholder letter, the company wrote that our outlook tempered by uncertainty surrounding our ability to efficiently grow paid app subscribers. So there you have it. Shares currently off by almost 10%. Yeah, and those uh, connected fitness subscribers came in at 3 million. And the estimate was sort of 3.01. Connect me up. Katie, thank you very much. Staying with the earnings season, World Caribbean delivers an upbeat forecast due to the record booking volumes since November. Isabel Lee is with me. Uh, big, big business, the Caribbean uh, cruise company. Big business indeed, Manus, which is why shares are popping up now by more than 4%. Full year EPS, the company said, will be between $9.50 to $9.70. That implies a 40% growth and is higher than analyst estimate. We have Wells Fargo saying that this guidance was, quote, impressive. And we have Stifle saying that they were, quote, quote, pleasantly surprised. So the bullishness stems partly from what they're seeing is a record start to the booking season. They saw their best five weeks of bookings so far in the recent weeks. And if they're on track, they will achieve operating efficiency goals in 2024. And that's one year ahead of schedule. The stock is, again, still rising, continuing its rise. It's up now by almost 5%. And it surged 162% last year, Manus. Isabel, thanks a million. Thank you very much. Uh, stocks are coming in for a third consecutive month of gains. It may be bumpy along the way, but here's what Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson had to say about the rally a little bit earlier. 
we had this big rally after you know the the pivot, and I would say it started with the Treasury squeeze when they said they're going to issue less coupons. So it was really a duration rally that then fed into a stock rally. And so now we're, you know, valuations are stretched again and people are looking around going, okay, what's next? What's the next catalyst? Well, let's put that very question uh, in conversation with Richard Bernstein, CEO and CIO at Richard Bernstein Advisors. Richard, good to see you this morning. I thought it was an interesting, um, a, a very succinct way of putting it. It was a duration trade, first of all, that gave you know, the elixir of life to equities. So what is it that delivers a step change up for equities? What is the catalyst next to continue the equity bull run? Good morning. Good morning, Manus. I think, well, you know, normally PE-driven markets are followed by earnings-driven markets. And I think that is the story that we should be looking at now for the next several quarters is the profit cycle has begun to trough. Profits are beginning to rev up. And um, I think, you know, in a portfolio, you don't want necessarily companies that are just interest rate sensitive and see multiple expansion, because we know if interest rates go up, multiples come down, the question is, will the multiple come down by the P going down in the PE or the E going up? Cyclicals are really where the E goes up in an earnings-driven market. So, I mean, Wilson's looking for high-quality growth. Those people, and I hear this time and time again, pricing power and strong balance sheets. Do I get that going for breadth? Do I get that going for the Russell? If it is going to be soft landing, I want breadth. And I don't want all my concentration risk in Mag 7. Look, look, I know Mike Wilson very well. He's a, he's a very smart guy. But I think we disagree with him right now in terms of the future role of the economy. What's going to be the path of the economy? And I think consensus is more, you know, we're still talking about landings. People are talking about is it going to be a hard landing or a soft landing. Will the economy slow? Um, I think an increasing amount of data is showing the economy is either bottoming or actually accelerating. And, and in that environment, as I said before, we think the profit cycle is starting to accelerate. When profit cycles accelerate, actually lower quality investments work better than higher quality investments because they're more cyclical, right? The cyclicals cause the cycle. We always have to remember that. And, and so um, stable growth and strong balance sheets are great when things are bad, mm -hmm. but when things are good, you actually want the financial leverage and the operating leverage on a balance sheet because they actually add to performance in when the cycle is good. And I think that's a, a big contrary that's sitting out there is that people are still waiting for the landing and the economy isn't really playing along with the forecast. And you're looking at the city economic surprises. I mean, OK, we had a little bit of a tick up on the jobless numbers today. We're going for 23 uh, consecutive readings on the jobs report, sub 4% on unemployment. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a winning streak in this U.S. economy. Is there anything that can put a break on it? So, so I think Manuscript will, will eventually put a break on it is what traditionally puts a break on it, which would be higher interest rates and the Fed tightening again. I think right now the amazing thing, which people don't want to really discuss, is the Fed has raised Fed funds 525 basis points, and the economy weathered that storm and seems to be getting a bit stronger now. So if profits are going from minus 15 percent, which was the trough growth rate in 23, to plus 15 percent, which we think is going to be the peak in 24, mm -hmm. that actually argues the Fed might actually have to raise interest rates in that environment. Are you committing heresy on this show, else? Richard Bernstein? Are you committing heresy on this show? <laughs> now, come on. I guess, I guess you I are am. going to be the only am. outlier out there that's calling for a rate hike. Are you seriously sitting on this show now this morning, Richard? Come on. And you're saying to me, man, no, I don't I'm not saying they're <laughs> they're definitely going to raise rates, but I think the notion and the certainty surrounding them cutting rates. Yes, I think is misguided. I think that, you know, to say that they're going to hold rates steady for longer than people think and potentially raise rates. I think that's more realistic than saying they're going to cut rates multiple times this year. What would what do you say to the uh, by the way, if you if that if that's the case, I hear I hear what you're saying, which is. Should I coalesce around three cuts and that still does not undermine the equity rally versus five to six cuts, which is being banged like a drum by the market? Mm -hmm. That's right. I think, look, I, I, I think that, that um, the Fed is really banking on sort of a productivity miracle. I'm not sure they would use that word, but, you know, and, and uh, the productivity gains that we're seeing continuing into the future to fight inflation. 
Uh, I'm not so bullish on productivity as they might be. Uh, I also would note that supply chain disruptions are starting again, mm -hmm. and that combined with some of the profits and the hiring argues that they're probably going to be very, very slow in cutting rates, much slower than the market anticipates. I love your line. Date cash, but never marry it. Is cash the unreli unreliable boyfriend or girlfriend? I mean, you know, I'm doing okay in cash. I actually am. I mean, I just sort of, I spoke to somebody yesterday. I'm about to pull the, you can always tell the top of a market, Richard. I, I, I've, got to, I've got to reinvest uh, some pension funds from the Middle East here into the United States of America. So if I'm going in, I'm telling you, this is the top of the market, Richard. Uh, but with that right. in mind, I still quite like five and a quarter in the CD. <laughs> So, you, you know, Manus, you're right. And, and, you know, maybe politically incorrect to use the line about, you know, dating cash but never marrying it. I get that. But, but I think it's important for two reasons. One is we have to remember when people say it's cash attractive, the answer is, of course it is. Right. I mean, that's why the Fed raises rates. The Fed injects monetary policy into the economy by raising short term rates, making cash attractive to try to disintermediate a broad range of investment opportunities throughout the economy. That's how monetary policy gets into the economy. So the Fed is raising rates. Of course, cash is going to be attractive. But yet people tend to fall in love with cash. Right. And that's the point. Cash is a short term investment. It's a way station. You're going from someplace to someplace and you're stopping off. It's not something for the long term. We know and, and history shows this very clearly. Cash is about as bad as it gets for long term investment opportunities. Short term. Yeah, it's fine. It's a short term investment. But I think we should really think of it as a short term investment. You're going to force me into, you know, a, a, an unreliable marriage with risk. I get that feeling towards the end of the year. <laughs> Richard, very, very briefly, you also are quite warm to commodity. Is that my inflation hedge? What should that be, 5 6% of the portfolio? Yeah, I think, I think commodities, Manister, are, and, and anything real asset related, I think are going to be a very potent, not only potentially cyclical, but a longer term story. If globalization is contracting, which I think most people would agree it probably is, it means pro-inflation assets are going to be uh, advantageous going forward. Remember, globalization was a major factor for secular disinflation here in the United States. Okay, we have a good authority behind you as a hockey jersey from New York Rangers. Big, big fan there, yeah? Go Rangers. Absolutely, season ticket holder. <laughs> Good lad. Uh, with the popcorn on the bill, Richard Bernstein, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, committing heresy on the market open. Not quite, but coming up. Zuckerberg, a bit of a grilling on Capitol Hill, wouldn't you say? Have you compensated any of the victims? I, These I, girls, I, have you compensated them? I don't believe so. You, why not? Well, well, don't you think they deserve some compensation for what your platform has done? Bruising day. Zuckerberg delivering an apology in front of Congress with the earnings due after the closing bell today. That conversation next on Bloomberg. Have you compensated any of the victims? I, These I, girls, I, have you compensated them? I don't believe so. Wh you, why not? Don't you think they deserve some compensation for what your platform has done? There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I, you like to do so now? Well, they're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? It really was high drama in Capitol Hill. Just take a look at these images. Was it choreographed or not? That's the question you must ask yourself. Senator Hawley grilling Mark Zuckerberg, prompting an apology to the families who say that Instagram, Instagram contributed to their children's suicides or exploitation. Zuckerberg was just one of several big tech CEOs facing that Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, discussing the various ways to improve online safety for children. Joining me now in terms of what we can expect today is our Bloomberg Technology co-host, Ed Ludlow. Ed, very theatrical, and it should be said he wasn't the only CEO that was brought in front uh, of Congress yesterday, although he did arrive voluntarily, uh, it, it exactly. should be added. So, bit of context for us, Ed. Good morning. 
Yeah, good morning. I mean, the, the, the reporting is it was an impromptu moment, and Zuckerberg did apologise. He would go on to say, I'm sorry for everything that you've all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have suffered. And as Bloomberg reports, and I encourage you to read the story, there are a number of activists and victims in the room, as Senator Josh Hawley alluded to, that had mixed reactions to that apology, many of them saying it's not good enough. This was important because it was the first time that Linda Yaccarino, the ex-CEO, testified in front of Congress, uh, as well as Evan Spiegel, the SNAP CEO. And, you know, the question is what comes out of this? Uh, and the answer is probably legislation. In the first instance, Linda Yaccarino uh, gave an endorsement for the Stop CSAM Act, uh, which has not yet to reach the Senate floor, but is an important piece of legislation in the context of child safety. Both she and Evan Spiegel um, also talked up other legislation, like the Kids Online Safety Act, but didn't give official endorsements. And as you know full well, Manus, the issue with these hearings is they can often venture off topic. Um, in the case of the TikTok CEO, for example, there was a line of questioning about his relationship with China and the Chinese Communist Party and the companies. His point was that, well, I'm from Singapore and I'm a, I'm a citizen of Singapore. Um, but often it goes off, off peak, off piece. This stayed very focused on child safety, which in an election year is critically important. Look, absolutely. And it is quite shocking. You've only got to go and look on Instagram for that, that question. Are you a member of the Communist Party? You just see the CEO look up in complete shock exactly. as, as to the politician not understanding his nationality. Uh, thank you very much. Ed Ludlow uh, with the very latest. Let's stick with Big Tech because it is Meta, Apple and Amazon all reporting the results. It's going to be after the closing bell. 15% of the S&P 500, a little bit higher on Amazon and Meta relative to Apple. And Facebook's parents company expected to post double-digit growth fuel by heavy investments in AI. Scott Devitt is Wedbush Securities. He joins me now. So you have an outperform rating on the stock, a PT of $350. Scott, good to have you with me. Uh, it's hard to believe Facebook is 20 years old this year. What's going to move the dial today? Is it going to be the ad spend or is it going to be the AI guidance? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I think the um, I think it's both. I think the ad spend, you know, the recovery in this business and the, the narrative of the stock has been um, quite amazing in the last 12 months. And I think that that's going to continue with the report today. We're looking for 39 billion in revenue up 21 percent. I, I think you'll hear Zuckerberg talk quite a bit about AR, AI, AR, VR infusion into the business. And, um, you know, they've kind of taken the air out of the room in the ad industry relative to, to Alphabet's recent report. And I think you'll see um, evidence, more evidence of that tonight. I mean, it was quite bruising, wasn't it, for Alphabet? I mean, they missed. I, and I know the principle is that they missed and that delivers uncertainty and therefore the future of what they've got to spend uh, really comes into to question. But when you look at Facebook, Instagram, Reels, WhatsApp and Threads, it's also going to be a monetization. Do you think that that's going to be, excuse the pun, a thread that we get more detail on? I do. I think particularly Reels. You know, you had this company a few years ago had issues with perception around the blue app, um, the core Facebook app and saturation. It had questions around Apple and IDFA. And it's gotten to kind of the other side of, of, of both of those debates very strongly and Instagram is picking up growth, but Reels is gonna be, is a $10 billion run rate business now. So when you think about the TikTok debate that existed, that's also been diffused. WhatsApp is doing better. There's click to messaging monetization in the business as well. So if you think of these stocks as kind of multiple fair value and, and narrative, you know, Facebook has flipped the narrative on its head. Conversely, you know, Google's dealing with something a little bit different now mm -hmm. where the business is actually doing quite well, but anything that it spends, investors immediately conclude that they have to spend more to drive search in an AI centric world and it's viewed negatively. Whether that proves to be true or not remains to be seen, but for call it the next 12 months, you know, that underlying narrative very much favors Meta over Alphabet. This comes down to what is the metamorphosis from a company called Facebook to a company called Meta? And what does it deliver in the AI sphere? One or two analysts are more forgiving of what's going on at Reality Labs, the spend at Reality Labs. Try and help me understand what meta and AI is. What is the star of AI in the meta name? 
Uh, so you have you have Advantage Plus, which is the advertising technology that's really come out of um, the post Apple IDFA period, and the ability to better target advertising. That's one component of, of of AI that will benefit the business. Probably the most relevant financially at the moment. Um, you know the the bets that the company is making with Reality Labs that are running at about a 15, 16 billion dollar annual loss right now are things like the Meta Smart Glasses and Llama, which is their version of the large language model, and the, the MetaQuest headsets, which are all very interesting open-ended opportunities. And, um, and what is so interesting with Meta now is you have that optionality built into the multiple. You're paying about 22 times earnings mm -hmm. for a business that has an embedded $16 billion loss on things that are still you know, on the come. So, one of two things could happen. Either A, they pull back because some things aren't working and you're, you're paying a lower multiple as an investor, or B, this actually works and it opens up um, top line growth. So I think either outcome is quite positive for the company. Obviously you want the growth, um, so that's the, the more prominent outcome, but either is positive. Not a bad roll of the dice at 22 times earning relative to some of the multiples that you've got out there. Scott, thank you very much. Good. Thank Let's you. see what we get later on this evening on the Meta Report. Sector price action. Let's get back to Abby. Well, with the S&P 500 up about four tenths of one percent, more sectors are higher than not led by some of those mega cap tech sectors. Let's take a look at the bottom, though, because we have some of the defensive sectors. We also have financials down three tenths of one percent. Let's dig in just a little bit more there. And not surprisingly, with the NYCB blow up yesterday, we do have the regional banking index down seven point five percent over the last three days. Uh, the worst stretch since October of last year for that ETF. Abby, thank you very much. I'm going to do a little there with the very latest on the sectors. Trading diary coming up. It is about earnings. Amazon, Apple, Meta are all delivering their numbers after the bell. The AI, day two of the AI evolution, revolution. Payrolls Friday, you got it. That's the only thing that really, really matters. Monday, you'll have had the hangover from payrolls and you're going to begin a little bit of Fed speak. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic. Tuesday, the earnings roll in from the European banking giant UBS and Friday, the earnings from PepsiCo. That's it for Countdown to the Open. We are nervous ahead of these meta earnings, as you've just heard. It is all about the advertising number in those. And Apple, can they break trend? Can they deliver a rise in revenue for the first time uh, in a number of quarters? That's it from me and the team on Countdown to the Open. Surveillance is up next. Actually, it's not surveillance. That was three, that was two hours ago. Thank you very much. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>